Thanks, Tushar. So, uh, yeah, thank you everyone for coming. One thing I'd like to, we would definitely like to get to audience questions. Please use uh, your app for those. I'm going to take preference to the app. I've got that, you've got it working here. We've already got questions coming in. So, um, please use the app. And, and that's how we'll get to the questions. Um, so we've got a, just an amazing panel here, and I'm not going to take up any more time. I'm going to ask each of them to uh, introduce themselves, and then also, um, just as briefly as possible, this, as, after you introduce yourself, tell us what your thesis, investment thesis in this space is that you know a, a founder in, in the audience should know when they come to pitch you. Uh, if you could, if you could uh, tell us as, as, you know, as briefly as possible kind of one, one thing that a founder should know about your investment approach to this space in addition to who you are. <laughs> so we'll start with Naveen. Sure. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Naveen Chada, Managing Director with Mayfield Fund. Mayfield is an early stage venture capital firm. We manage over $3 billion. Uh, as far as the cloud ecosystem is concerned, um, we are investing at different levels of the stack. Uh, at the application layer, we are investing in SaaS. We are investing in things which can be built around public clouds, things in the private cloud area, and also things in and around the hybrid cloud. And I'm sure during the conversation, we're going to touch upon a lot of these topics. Hi, uh, my name is Vivek Mehra. I'm a general partner at August Capital. We're an early stage um, IT focused venture fund managing um, similar, about $3 billion. We closed a last fund, which is a four and a half, uh, no, $450 million fund. We do, uh, prim prim I say, primarily early stage uh, investments, Series A and above. And I would define Series A as um, you know a team that is um, you know as team that that has a pretty well defined idea. They need not have product uh, done, but uh, a thesis that is pretty well defined that that they can defend. Um, within the IT landscape, we do everything in the security, cloud, um, private cloud, public cloud landscape uh, investments. Thanks, guys. My name is Arif John Mohammed. I'm a partner at Lightspeed Venture Partners. We're Early stage VCs um, managing about four billion dollars in capital. Just raised 1.2 billion earlier this year. Uh, we are completely buzzword friendly and compliant. So any buzzword, whether it's uh, big data, amp, machine learning, AI, we are investing in those spaces. Our general thesis is that there's hundreds of billions of dollars of market cap up for grabs as we shift to the cloud. And Amazon is absolutely representative at $10 billion run rate right now for in terms of cloud revenues of this massive shift that's underway. Thanks. So uh, questions are starting to come in. And one, one question that was already on my mind is a lot of my founders are nervous right now about what's going on in the, in the market. You know, there's been a, basically a slowdown with tech IPOs and their public market uncertainties. So the question really is, in the remainder of 2016, um, would you, through your fund, expect to lead a Series A investment into a company in this space led by a first-time founder? Let's forget people who have already made money for you, but um, you know, a first-time founder in this space, are you, are, how likely is it that you're going to fund a company like that in a significant Series A um, in the next few months? We just go in the same order, or you prefer? That's fine. <laughs> OK. Uh, so I think um, even though these are like tough times, uh, our belief is over the 46 year history we've been in business, the best companies actually are created in the toughest times. And it's a very good time for entrepreneurs and VCs to be funding companies. Now it remains open whether it's a first time founder or a second time founder. It really depends on the idea and the team. And both kinds of people are getting funded. And actually I believe our deal pace this year will be higher than it was last year and the year before because valuations were really, really crazy two years back and even last year. So we are very, very bullish because venture, you have to take a long-term perspective. It's a marathon, it's not a sprint. You have to look what's going to happen seven to 10 years from now, not what's happening today. So we are very, very bullish at Mayfield on Series A investing. Okay. Uh, absolutely. I think some of the best companies uh, have been founded by first-time entrepreneurs in tough times. So we are absolutely looking to invest in co such companies. Likewise, we are open for business. Uh, the, the answer is absolutely categorically 
a hundred percent chance yes this year that we fund a first time entrepreneur in a series A in this space um, and if you look back over our history over 20 plus years uh, of being in business whether it's up times or down times we have backed exceptional entrepreneurs through tough times and good times. Great, well that's really great news for, um, for everyone here I'm sure. Uh, so let's start getting into some of the more uh, some of the more meaty topics. Um, one question that's been asked is will startups in the container space make money um, when Docker ha has had such trouble uh, making money and what's your view with respect to that space? And why don't we start at the other end? I'm, I'm not sure why you'd say that Docker is having trouble making money. It's early innings for Docker. Docker has amazing breadth and traction so far. They are in the early innings of making money, but they are making money and they are making revenues. Uh, this is a new ecosystem that's being built out, that's being born, and we're, we're probably in the third or probably second or third inning of this ecosystem being built out. And if you look at the last major trend in this space, virtualization, there were a number of great companies that came out of that, uh, that, that trend and that, um, that, that through line. So uh, I, I do believe that there will be some great companies that come out of this, uh, this new disruption. Great. Any, any disagreements, any other thoughts? Uh, so I think I agree with what was said, right? Like, again, Docker is a new technology, over two billion downloads, lot of adoption with developers, lot of adoptions with DevOps, and now is finally getting into production with IT ops. And any time a new technology happens, Docker is the platform company, but it's opening up many opportunities in and around that. So we have made a lot of investments in and around the Docker ecosystem. One investment is Portworks, which is in the container storage area. They're really building hyperconvert storage for container environments, not VM environments. We are investors in a company called Rancher Labs, which is helping Docker workloads run in production. They help with orchestration, management. We're investors in another stealth mode company which is doing monitoring for containerized and microservices applications. So tremendous opportunities early. One has to be patient and just keep going. Yeah. So what I, the, the one thing I, I would say here to a lot of the entrepreneurs is Docker and other technologies like this that gain incredible momentum um, often encourages entrepreneurs to just jump in. You know, you see this new shiny object that happens and off, very often us on the venture side, you know, see a, a slew of companies coming in. What I would encourage entrepreneurs to, to see is look, th think through the business model for your own companies. Because we see one company and then we see 10 similar companies coming in and which is kind of disheartening for us and also for us to tell the entrepreneurs because everyone thinks they, you know, they're the only ones working on that. And, but we've just seen in the last 10 days five companies similar to that. And we can't tell them that, look, look we've just seen five other companies just like you and, and it's going to be incredibly competitive. So two things that entrepreneurs should think about is, are you just chasing the next shiny object? And do you have a fundamental business model behind yours? So I think your question alludes somewhere to that, that not only does, is, is there a fundamental business behind your technology, and will it be sustaining and will it be big enough? And uh, will Doc, well, Docker itself as a company, will, how much money will they make? And are you drafting just about it, about behind a big company? And are you a derivative business model? And very often we see derivative business models that often are not going to be big sustainable companies. And that is a big concern for us when we look at companies. And we've turned down a lot of these derivative business model companies because we don't think they have legs. But look, uh, just to take a, a, a different approach because we want a controversy, yes. right? Yes. So uh, I would argue that great markets attract a lot of really great people and, and a lot of great talent. And smart people come up with, the, with similar ideas at the same point in time. If you even look, you know, go back and look at history, 60, 70 years ago the transistor was invented on both sides of, of the country by independent teams. And so great disruptions, massive technology platforms that are emerging create opportunity and smart people will gravitate to those opportunities. So even if there happens to be com competition, that, that's not necessarily a reason not to do, not to, not to start a company. And competition is not necessarily a reason for us not to fund a company, from, from my perspective. No, no, I'm, 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 I'm totally with you. It's just that what we've, we've seen is 
one company being funded and then there's five others and all of a sudden yeah. there are 10 venture backed companies fighting for the same dollars and I think it that itself I think it's is 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 not good practice. Is that the entrepreneur's all. fault or is that our fault? <laughs> it's, it, it's it's actually both our faults, yeah. right? It's both yeah. the things and a lot of time what happens is 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 VCs think about we should have a play in that sector and then three of us will place the bet in, in that sector and then we're just using our LP's money to fight and waste, right? So that's, that I feel is not good practice for anyone's sake. So, so what do you think the, the VC should do in that case? If there are two companies that are already funded in that sector, you should just pass on the sector? I, no, I, I, I don't know if it's a, we don't know. Often what happens is some of these companies are in stealth mode, so we don't even know th that, that, that those sectors have been funded. Yeah, so Sometimes it's just, it's just luck of the draw. Sometimes you don't know it happens, but very often only one company will succeed and the second or third companies may not, may not be that successful. Actually, right, just to add controversy and some data, we promised each other that's what we'll do. <laughs> uh, actually, history has shown sometimes I'll give the- i the card to my antitrust partner. <laughs> good, good. Actually, it turns out a lot of times the first company that gets to market is not the winner. Let's look yeah. at Google. They were not the first ones to search. They were not the first ones to invent the business model. Another company which has succeeded a lot in today's environment is Facebook. Yep. They were not the first social network. So I think what matters is a lot of times it's people who make companies, not the other way. Right. And timing is everything. So you could be an early mover, get to market first, but the market wasn't ready. And two of the biggest companies of this era, Google and Facebook, weren't the first movers. And a lot of VCs, including us, passed on those companies and said, oh, you're me too. It's already taken. So I think one needs to just have an open mind. There's no set rule, I would say. I think say. at the end it all boils down to the, the team, which is why I think a lot of us spend an incredible amount of time, you know, either doing diligence with the team or spending time with the people, seeing do we really want to work with these people for the eight, next eight to ten years? Yeah, it's a marathon. Let's, let's talk about another subject area. The panel right before us was talking about the convergence of cloud and big data and predictive analytics, and some people think this is an overhyped space. Um, what, what's, what's the panel's opinion? We don't have, each of you doesn't have to talk, but uh, if anyone has an opinion about the space, um, predictive analytics and big data and cloud. So I'm, you know, some of the more interesting companies that we funded or I've been involved with recently actually have been using um, these kind of analytic techniques to reinvent the way whether security is being done or storage is being analyzed. I think a lot of stuff has converged. You know, data now can be stored <coughs> cheaply and effectively. Algorithms have improved significantly over the next last few years that you can analyze these data in, in amazing amounts of ways. So. A lot of things are being reinvented, so I think this is a really fascinating ways uh, in which it's not about new platforms or s as such, but it's, it's really how these platforms are being utilized to analyze data in specific vertical applications. So I'm, I'm super excited about it. Yeah, I'd, I'd take a similar approach. I wouldn't see this as a space. I wouldn't see the convergence of big data and cloud as a particular space. I would see those two buzzwords as uh, enabling technologies. They're, they're essentially enabling a new set of applications or, um, or infrastructure, approaches to infrastructure technologies that were until now completely uh, impossible, right? If the, if the cost to store, process, and analyze a bit of data is essentially zero thanks to things like Hadoop and Spark, well, what does that mean from a processing perspective and from, a, from, from, from an application perspective? And how do you apply those techniques to uh, amazing verticals? So I'll give you an example. Uh, we, we invested in a company called Blend Labs. This is a company that, that is founded by a team that came out of Palantir. And they looked at the $3 trillion mortgage industry and they realized that it, t it can take in some cases three to six months to process a mortgage. So they thought about that. Why does it take three to six months to process a mortgage? And they broke down the workflow for processing a mortgage. And then they looked at the available technologies today and they realized that they could shrink that time down to a matter of days. And so just like you can get a Geico an, an answer from Geico in 15 minutes or less, these guys asked themselves, why can't you get an answer on your mortgage in 15 minutes or less? And it was actually a timing around the technology 
and they're using big data under the hood, they're using cloud under the hood, but they're not a big data or cloud company, they're actually a mortgage processing company. Okay. Let's talk about um, private cloud infrastructure uh, startups. Uh, are startups in that space um, viable given the success of public clouds? I mean, do you, are you funding startups in the sort of private cloud infrastructure space? Sure. So I think, uh, so first of all, I would say there are many interesting opportunities even in the public cloud era. Uh, AWS, right, it's a 10-year-old architecture. It's designed for certain kind of workloads. We believe there is need for like new kinds of vertical clouds or specialized clouds. Even in the public domain, we just funded a company which is going to take on AWS and Azure. And I can't talk about what workloads they're talking about, but both Amazon and Azure claim they are only working on certain kind of workloads, right? If you look at private clouds, you need scale, you need agility, you need ease of use, and it's becoming harder. I won't say the game is over. You have to really focus on what problem you're solving. So for example, storage clouds, object storage clouds, or even in general the archival tier that Amazon offers with Glacier, a lot of it is happening on-prem. So you have to pick which market you're going after, which problem you're trying to solve, and then there are opportunities in the hybrid cloud space. How do you help enterprises, whether large, mid, or small, adopt public clouds. But just the private cloud space, it's a tough, tough space where you have to really be careful of what problems you go and solve. Makes sense. Yeah, agreed. Uh, pri pri to a certain extent. So uh, I, I, I believe the conversation that's happening at the sea level in you know, the global 2000 today is to what extent and in what time frame do we adopt the public cloud? Uh, and to, to what extent do we keep certain classes of applications inside our perimeter? And to what extent do we allow second, maybe third, maybe fourth tier applications to go outside our perimeter? And how do we bridge the gap between the two of those? And when you think about how do you bridge the gap, well, that comes down to private cloud or more on-premise type solutions. And I think that the next five to seven years will create a series of opportunities that bridge the gap between private cloud and public cloud and allow application workloads to be characterized and to be pushed between clouds, whether it's your own infrastructure or whether it's somebody else's infrastructure, uh, based on your policy associated with those workloads. I think the, the low end of the market will will increasingly go to the public cloud. The mid end of the market and the high end of the market will, the mid end of the market will be more, you know, hybrid. The high end of the market, I think, still will remain on the private side for some time. We have investments in a company called Mirantis that is targeting a lot on the high end side and is having amazing amount of success in the private cloud. We have companies, a company called Appformix that is helping private clouds and some public clouds monitor their, uh, their performance of their of the private clouds very effectively. So there, 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 is, there is tremendous opportunity still. I, you know, it's like the mainframe, the, the last, last panel was talking, is the mainframe dead? I mean, it's been talked about being dead for the last 40 years, 30 years since I've been in, in this business and, and in, 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 in the computing business. It's, it, these things aren't going to go away. Yeah, I would point to the, to the success of Nutanix, which is one of the yeah. fastest growing infrastructure companies in history, and they're essentially creating and selling private cloud infrastructure. Yeah. I mean, so, the mainframe uh -huh. is dead, long live the mainframe. Yeah. Okay, we've got a ton of audience questions. I'm going to start going to them. We're not going to have time for all of them, I'm sure. Um, what's your take on the funding landscape in the ed tech SaaS sector? In the ad tech? Ad tech? Yeah, no, ed tech, education. Like in, in ed tech, you know, in software as a service. I'm not as familiar with that sector. Since so I think SaaS, right, like is a very, very promising area. A uh, lot of investments are going in there. And if you look at what's happening there is most of the companies that were created, whether it was Salesforce or whether it was Workday, they were around being systems of record and horizontal applications. Now there is need for vertical applications, analytics-oriented applications, and systems of engagement. So I can go into a CRM system and enter the data as a salesperson, but day in and day out, I'm doing work on LinkedIn, I'm doing work on email. How do I automate all that stuff? 
So we are seeing a new breed of companies emerge in SaaS, which are systems of engagement or our analytic apps or our vertical SaaS apps. As far as the ed tech sector is concerned, um, I would say it goes hot and cold. It depends upon which end of the market you're going. If you're going and selling into schools or universities, it's hard to essentially make money, but a lot of the companies today which are in distance learning or doing over-the-top education, that's where a lot of the money is going. I, I don't so, know so what B2C, your... So B2C, you're, you're interested in B2C more than, more than B2B. In, in, in the ed tech in, space? In the ed tech space. That, that's where yeah. we've been focused. I, I don't know what your perspective has been. I, I have to admit, I don't spend too much time in the space, but I'd, I'd agree with the characterization. I mean, the framework that you laid out makes a lot of sense, which is, any type of company that sells to the government or to, to a public institution is in for a very, very long sales cycle. And then this is further exasperated by the fact that schools, K-12 or even higher ed, uh, tend to have buying cycles that I, I, I don't believe the exact, I don't know the exact buying cycle, but I think it's, it's, it's in Q2 and Q4 where they actually do I'm probably wrong on that, but there are two quarters where they're not buying, and then there are two quarters where they are buying, which makes uh, you know smoothing out your yearly revenues quite a quite it, quite hard. Because if you miss a cycle, then you're essentially sitting around for six months waiting for the decision cycle to open. Higher ed might be a little more flexible. Okay, thanks. There are a lot of questions here about pitching you guys. So, how how precise does a startup need to be in defining their target market when they come to see you? So, you know, since, so since we look at Series A and beyond, we like to, to have the companies that pitch to us be, be quite precise into the target markets that they're going after. And by that, we mean who exactly do they sell to what. It's not like they just sell to the financial sector. We like them to be much more precise which, which, sector, with, which audience within that financial sector. Are they selling to the mid-tier, the high-end tier, or, or the low-end of that tier? Which, uh, level within the sector do they, they, they sell to, what is the price point, so be as precise as possible. Have they spoken to, to the, audio, the target customers before, what price points have they been, what are the sales cycles, so try to be as precise as, as possible because that builds credibility within uh, when, when they come to us. Actually our approach is different uh, than this thing, like we make bets on people and we try to figure out have they identified a problem which is a painkiller and a must-have for some segment of the market and we are willing to roll up our sleeves and figure out the journey along with them? Because it's hard at a Series A, half the companies pivot. So to have like well-defined precision, there are examples, right? Like we're investors in Lyft, for example, very successful company. They were doing like not even what they're doing today, they had to shut down that business. But we believed in the team, we believed that there's going to be something happening in transportation and said, let's go along for the ride. We, we need five uh, decimal point precision. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, the, you know, I, we, I, the way I think about market size uh, is, is really it's a framework for how the entrepreneur is thinking about their target market and then that target market then informs their go-to-market strategy. And I'll tell you the biggest turnoff is when an entrepreneur tells me that their target market is, is 50 billion or 60 yeah. billion because it means that they don't really understand their target market and who they're selling to and what segment of the market they're selling to, which then therefore means that they don't quite understand how they're going to go to market and how they're going to sell and to whom they're going to sell and who their buyer is. And so when it comes down to precision, I'm really looking for th elements more like what Vivek is looking for, but I would absolutely agree with Naveen in terms of uh, we, 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 when it really comes down to brass tacks, we're backing a, a founding team. And that founding team, uh, if they're exceptional, they will zig and zag in the target market that they're going after. Okay, uh, what about exit strategy? Do you want to see a slide on exit strategy or is that a waste of space? That, that, is the, that is actually one of the things that I use as a filter. So if you're telling me that you're going to sell to Google or Facebook or, or VMware in three years, uh, you've just disqualified yourself. Because it means that you're focused on the wrong thing, which is you're focused on how much money can I make in as little time as possible, which is an absolute turnoff for me. 
I would rather you tell me how big a company you're going to build and how, how sustainable that company is going to be and how much value you're going to capture in a large, large market. And then the implicit exit strategy there is, at some point or another, there will be an IPO, which in my opinion is just another financing event. Yeah, okay. I would agree. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I agree. All right, I think we're out of time, but uh, please join me in thanking our panel. And I'll be here for a few minutes. Thank you.